People are suffering. People, everybody has problems, everyone has issues, and a lot of people don't have the answers. What is life about? Why is there any meaning to life? Is there any purpose? Where can we find joy in the midst of suffering? All of these questions have their answers in Jesus. And so it's absolutely critical that we be willing to share that answer with people who are hurting, starving, thirsting for the answer that we have in Christ. I think the way that God has always reached out and blessed and reached and restored people is through blessing them. So a really simple way to be scattering is asking God, who are you sending me to and how can I bless them today? When I think of us scattering seed, I think uh, one of the biggest parts is that we would embody the lavish generosity of God, that we would both in how we proclaim Jesus and how we share and embody his love in our lives, that we would uh, just really live out the love of God in a way that people encounter Christ and in through us as his people. You know, it's funny when you talk about what's the greatest obstacle to spreading the gospel or evangelism today. Uh, you can look at culture, you can look at morality, and but it's us. It is simply us. It always has been us. It always will be us. We are called to be light. We are called to be salt. That's what Jesus said. That's what outreach is going to look like. So it's not about the world around you. Don't give me, well, the darkness or what we live in. It's supposed to be dark around us. Our nation isn't supposed to be walking with God. In darkness, the light shines even brighter and people see it. So the great obstacle is not externally what has happened. The obstacle is where are we walking with God? I mean, I, it's been said at this conference, you know, the harvest is ripe. The harvest is ready. It's the work that are few. It's not the world that needs help or changing. It's Christians who just need to walk with God with an openness, an urgency, and a desire, and a heart for those that are lost around them. If we could get people to really see that God's already gone ahead and is reaching them, it might give us the confidence to understand we're just playing a small part in that journey by getting it. So the obstacle, again, is we think evangelism is all us doing it when in reality God's gone ahead of us and God is in us doing what we do in it. There are a lot of people in your life that are just waiting for you to believe God can work in their lives and that you will just take simple steps to show and share the love of Christ. while since you've had somebody ask this question, but I'll ask you a question. Can I, can I read you a story? Okay. So here's my story. It's called The Velveteen Rabbit. All right? And it begins like this. There was once a velveteen rabbit. He was fat and bunchy. His coat was spotted brown and white. His ears were lined with pink satin. And it goes on. Here's a picture. He's in a little Christmas stocking there. Remember that when, when someone would read your story and they turn the book around and show you the picture real slowly? Hopefully when you were little, someone read you stories. A, a, a parent, a grandparent, a teacher at school. Uh, for those of you that don't know what a, a story book is, it's like a movie, but with just words on paper and pictures and not moving up on a screen. The beauty of books is that they're only, the only boundary of the screen is the breadth of your mind. I've, never, I've actually never read a story and seen a movie and thought the movie was better. I think what you can create in your own brain, the way God's made our minds to imagine to see, is actually more colorful and pic uh, pictorial and powerful than, than what we can see on a screen. But, uh, but light, in all of life, there's stories being told. You know, I've got this one. I've got the ugly duckling. And these are stories that have incredible messages within them. As I was getting a little bit older, uh, my, my parents got me turned on to, on to a guy named Edgar Rice Burroughs. And I read, I think, 35 or 40 books that were Tarzan books, John Carter of Mars. I still have them all, by the way. Uh, and then, then uh, I've got the Chronicles of Narnia up here, The Match, a great story I read just, uh, just in the last year or so about a great golf match. Just stories are powerful because they paint a picture and oftentimes teach life lessons within the story. And Jesus, Jesus was a master storyteller. Jesus often told stories as he tried to teach concepts because the story would lock the truth in our hearts and our minds. What I want to talk about today is, and what we're going to do today is actually just look at two stories from the Bible. The story of a guy named Paul, and then also the story of a woman who we don't even know her name, a woman who Jesus met at a well. And as we look at their stories, here's what I want to have happen is for us to be able to say, if you're a Christian, if you're a follower of Jesus, to say, I can learn how to tell my story. Because the world is waiting to hear a story that's compelling and powerful and life-changing. And if you're a Christian, 
you have that story. As a matter of fact, you have many stories of God's presence and God's power. And what God wants you to do is to get comfortable, I would say naturally or organically, share your stories of how God has changed your life, how Jesus came into your life. And if you're not yet a Christian and you come to a place where you put your faith in Jesus, then God will give you stories to tell and the world is still waiting to hear this amazing life-changing story that every Christian carries in their heart. So I want to pray this morning that God will speak to our hearts and will actually give you, if you're a follower of Jesus or if you, when you become a Christian, that you will be bold and clear and free and comfortable to share the stories of God's presence and power because the world is waiting to hear not just a story, but his story and specifically his story through you. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, I believe that every person here who's come to the cross, who's received you as Savior, they have a story to tell. They have a story of their own coming to you and faith in you. But they also have stories to tell of what you did this week and last week and what you're going to do tomorrow and the next day. Because God, you are powerful and you're present and you're doing things in our lives. And so open our hearts and our ears to hear these stories. And through the stories we hear today, prepare us to share your story as we share our story in the flow of our normal days and lives. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. If you have a Bible, turn with me to the book of Acts chapter 9. In Acts chapter 9, we meet a guy named Saul, and Saul hates Christians. Saul is very religious. He's devout as a Jewish person, but he hates Christians. He believes that what their faith is about and who this Jesus was is all a lie. And so we pick up Saul's story in Acts chapter 9, beginning in verse 1. Meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. Just pause there for a minute. When you hear a story that begins, this person was breathing out murderous threats. It's a scary beginning. The very breath that he breathed for Saul was the desire to see Christians destroyed, churches destroyed, Christian families destroyed, and in many cases, Christians killed and executed. So he went to the high priest, and he asked for letters to the synagogues in Damascus, so that if he found any there who belonged to the way, that was the Christian way, following Jesus, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. And so now he's traveling on this road to Damascus, he has paperwork from the Jewish Supreme Court to persecute Christians. As he neared Damascus, verse 3 of Acts 6, on this journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground, and he heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. And the voice says this, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. There's a story. There's an encounter. For Saul, his life changed on the road to Damascus. He was going full speed in one direction. 95 miles an hour, full speed, and throw it in reverse. His whole life gets changed. At this moment, everything changes because he meets Jesus, and he finds out that Jesus is not a lie, but Jesus is the Messiah. He's the Savior, and his whole life is turned around. He actually is, is, becomes blind because of the light. He's taken into the city. A man named Ananias, who's a follower of Jesus, has this vision, and God says, Ananias, go to the man named Saul. Ananias says to God, don't want to go. I know about this guy. He's killing Christians. He's persecuting Christians. Ananias is thinking he's coming and acting like he's a Christian so he can get us to come out of our hiding then he's going to kill us. He doesn't want to go. God says go. So Ananias goes. I love it. You can read in Acts chapter 9. When Ananias encounters him, he says to him, brother. He calls him brother because God said to him, he's put his faith in me. And Ananias is still terrified. Saul has a reputation. But Ananias touches him and like these scales fall off his eyes. He can see. And Paul, Saul is his name. He becomes Paul. He becomes the apostle Paul. Saul, the Christian killer, becomes Paul, the church planter, the evangelist, the lover of people. That's a changed life. That's radical. And for the rest of his life, guess what he does? He keeps telling his story. In the book of Acts, at least three times, he retells the story and retells the story and retells the story. So if you have your Bibles, turn to Acts chapter 26. (coughs) 
And in Acts chapter 26, we kind of continue this story of Saul, who now has become Paul. Now years and years and years have gone by, and he's planted churches, and he's preached the gospel, and he's been persecuted. Now, he was being persecuted just like he used to persecute Christians. He's being persecuted as a Christian. Now he's in jail for two years. And the governor, a guy named Festus, the governor doesn't want to make a decision. Why? Because if he lets him go, the Jews are going to be angry at him, and that area is predominantly Jewish. But if he actually condemns him, he's in trouble because he hasn't done anything wrong. So he just leaves him in jail for two years. What were you doing two years ago? Can you imagine sitting in jail for two years because the governor can't, really doesn't want to make any waves? Leaves him there. Then a guy named Agrippa comes to visit. Agrippa's the king of that region. And, and Festus realizes, oh, if I get Agrippa to make a decision, I can kind of put it off on him. And also Agrippa had a higher place of authority. Agrippa was actually Jewish. He was actually, he was actually in the lineage of Herod the Great. And so, so Agrippa is Jewish, but he's kind of working in the, in, in for the Roman government. But he's over the area of Jerusalem. And he actually gets to assign who becomes the high priest. And he's in charge of all the offerings put in the temple. So he's got this religious connection, but he's sort of a political animal. And, and so Agrippa shows up. And so Festus comes with Agrippa and this whole crowd of people, and they bring Paul. He's been in jail for two years, waiting for someone to kind of listen. He's got to share a little bit, but he's pretty much just waiting. And now he gets to speak in front of Agrippa. Pick this up in Acts 26, beginning in verse 1. Then Agrippa said to Paul, you have permission to speak for yourself. Paul, you can talk. And Paul is ready to talk. You know what he's going to do? Debate theology? No. Philosophy? No. You know what he's going to do? Tell a story. He just wants to tell his story. He met Jesus. Jesus changed him. And he wants to tell his story. So he begins to unfold his story. Look at verse 4. He says, The Jewish people all know the way I lived ever since I was a child, from the beginning of my life in my own country, and also in Jerusalem. And verse 5 says this, They have known me for a long time and can testify, if they're willing, I was conformed to the strictest sect of our religion, living as a Pharisee. He says, I mean, I was not just religious. I was like the religious, religious elite. We tithed on everything. If we got, if we got this much you know, of a spice, we would take a tenth of it and we'd give it, wrap it up and give it away. I mean, he says, I followed all the rules, all the regulations. I was totally religious. He goes on to explain this about himself. He said, and, and because of my faith, because I believed in God, I thought this Jesus was a lie. So here's what I did. He, look at verse 9 of, of Acts 26. I too was convinced that I ought to do all that was possible to oppose the name of Jesus of Nazareth. I was against Jesus. He tells this, he tells this to Agrippa and to Festus, to all those that are listening. And then verse 10. And that is just what I did in Jerusalem. On the authority of the chief priest, I put many of the Lord's people in prison. And listen to this. And when they were put to death, they, plural, many people, when they were put to death, I cast my vote against them. Paul stands there and says, I hated Christians. I had them killed. I had them arrested. I had them destroyed. I was so convinced that what I was doing was right. He said, many times I went from one synagogue to another and had people punished. He just goes on about all the things he did. He says, but then one day, I wanted to get more Christians, wanted to persecute more Christians, so I got papers from the, for the Supreme Court, and I basically went to Damascus to persecute more Christians. Verse 14. What happens is he says, this bright light, verse 13, this bright light from heaven comes as we're traveling, brighter than the sun and the blazing in the middle of the day. We all fell to the ground, and I heard a voice saying to me in Aramaic, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? It is hard for you to kick against the goads. Then I asked, who are you, Lord? I am Jesus whom you are persecuting, the Lord replied. And he goes on to say, and then Jesus basically told me, you're going to become a preacher and you're going to travel the world and talk about me. This one you hated, this one you persecuted. These Christians you hated, you're going to become one of them. And Saul experiences this, this transformation. And so he goes on. In verse 23, to say, to say that, that the Messiah would suffer and as the first to rise from the dead would bring the message of light to his own people and to the Gentiles. He, Saul starts to, Paul now starts to preach Jesus to Agrippa and to Festus and all the people who are listening. He said, I got an audience here. I may, be in, I may be in chains still, but I have an audience. So I'm gonna tell my story again and tell my story again how Jesus changes lives, how he changed my life. And then verse 24, I love this. At this point, Festus interrupted Paul's defense. Remember, Festus is kind of a Roman political person. He doesn't understand the Jewish religion very well. He says, you're out of your mind, Paul, he shouted. Your great learning is driving you insane. And he says, I'm not insane, most excellent Festus, Paul replied. But what I'm saying is true and reasonable. I'm giving you a true and reasonable explanation of the faith. And then he turns back to Agrippa, the king. And he says, the king is familiar with all these things. And I can speak freely to him. 
I am convinced that none of this has escaped his notice because it was not done in the corner. It was done in secret. So now P Paul turns to Agrippa, this king, who is serving the Roman government, who oversees the temple and the priesthood and all the offerings. I mean, he has influence in the Jewish world. And he says, King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? I know you do. He says, I know your history, your background. I know you've read the prophets. Do you believe that this Jesus is the Messiah, the fulfillment of all the prophets have pointed to? Look at verse 28. And then Agrippa said to Paul, do you think that in such a short time you can persuade me to be a Christian? He says, Paul, you're trying to get me to become a Christian, aren't you? Look at, look at Paul's response in verse 29. Paul replied, short time or long, I pray to God that not only you, but all who are listening to me today may become what I am, a Christian. He says, except for these chains. I wish you to become a Christian. I just wish you wouldn't have the chains on you like I have them on me. What a story. This is Saul's story who became Paul. He met Jesus on the road to Damascus. He was changed. He came to see Jesus as the Messiah, the Savior, the one who died on the cross and rose again, and he responded to and accepted the grace of Jesus. That's his moment of change. So, here's some lessons from Paul's journey. Because here's the thing. God will tell you, if you're a follower of Jesus, you have a story to tell. It's not his story, it's your story. So here's some lessons for us to learn as we tell our story of Jesus. Here's the first one. Your story is just that, your story, and it's unique to you. You have your story, and it's nobody else's story. Some of you are like, well, you know, I don't have like a really dramatic story. You know, I wasn't like in drugs and living in the gutters and falling apart, and then Jesus turned my life around. I, I wish I had a story like that. No, you don't. That's not your story. If it is your story, it is your story. But I look at my wife, Sherry. Her story, she became a Christian when she was five years old. She was five. Her story, went to church Sunday morning, to church services, went Sunday evening for another service, new music, new sermon, twice a Sunday. <laughs> Praise God, don't you wish we had that here? But that's, that's West Michigan, twice a Sunday. And then on Wednesday to Wednesday night, uh, catechism. And she was like the last one to leave. She loved it. She would, in her story, she'd say, I grew up loving Jesus. I can't remember when I didn't love Jesus. That's her story. But she'll tell you how Jesus came into her heart and changed her life. Her Damascus Road, her moment of change, was in Holland, Michigan, in the living room at her home when she was five years old. She met Jesus. That's her story. My story, I was 16. Grew up in a non-believing home. My Damascus Road where I met Jesus was on a houseboat in the Sacramento Delta. That's my story. For Paul, it was on the road to, to Damascus. What about you? You have a story. You met Jesus. If you're a Christian, you met Jesus. And he's been changing your life ever since. That's your story. Listen closely. You don't have to tell anybody else's story. But listen closely. You need to tell your story. Amen? You have a story. If you're a Christian, you have a story to tell. You've met Jesus. Second thing we learned from Paul. Who I was before and who I am now. Paul said, listen, before, I hated Christians. I persecuted them. I was destroying the church. Now I'm a church planter, a missionary, and a Christian, and an evangelist. Wow. Change. <laughs> But he said, my life changed because of Jesus. I, I look at my life. I changed when I met Jesus. My life dream and goal was to be a 21 dealer in a casino. <laughs> Went a different direction on this one. That was, that was my goal. That was my goal. I wanted to be a ski bum and deal cards at night, and that was my plan for life. God sent me in a different direction. I've changed. So have you. When you tell your story, talk about who you were, and tell people how God has changed you. I was so radically addicted, I couldn't control myself. I've been set free because of Jesus. I'm changed. I was fearful. I lived in constant fear. I live with confidence now because I've met Jesus. I loved money so much. It's what drove me. It's what I lived for. It was all I cared about, and I kept it all for me, me, me. I've become generous, and I share what God gives me because I see it as a gift. I've been changed. I had no purpose in life. I have meaning now in life. I was lonely all the time. Now I have a closest friend who never leaves me. His name is Jesus. I was violent and mean-spirited. I'm compassionate, and I'm growing to love others. I was driven by anger. I'm moved by kindness. You've been changed. If you're a Christian, that's your story. Tell your story. People want to know, can God change their life? Well, he's changed your life. Tell your story. Number three from Paul's story, how God showed up in your life. Just tell how God showed up. Now he keeps showing up. For Paul, God showed up on the road to Damascus. For you, God showed up in some way 
Now, you might not have been blinded by a light and knocked off a donkey. Okay, that's not your story. But God showed up, didn't he? He's in your life. He's real. And God keeps showing He just keeps showing up, doesn't he? That's your story. Talk about it. And then within his story, notice this. The Apostle Paul talks about the life, the death, and the resurrection of Jesus. When you tell your story, you got to talk about Jesus. Because in my story is his story. What's changed me isn't me. What's changed me is Jesus. I remember one time my dad said a while back, I was talking about my, when I became a Christian, I was just sharing my story, my testimony with him again. And my dad said, yeah, I remember that when you were in the middle of your years in high school and you met those really nice kids and it started to change your life. You met these nice kids and hanging out with nice kids changed your life. I said, dad, you still don't understand. What changed my life was not hanging out with nice kids. I met, I told him, I met Jesus. And Jesus introduced me to some other nice Christian kids. And some Christian kids that were still trying to figure out how to be nice. But God, but Jesus showed up. And I said, but it was Jesus, not nice kids. Tell the story. And your story is the story of Jesus. He really lived. He really died on the cross. He really rose again. He's forgiven you. And he loves you. Tell about Jesus' story while you tell your story. And then one more lesson from Paul. Do you believe? Do you believe? I hope you do. There's a moment where he looks, at, looks and says, says, listen. Do you believe? You expect this quickly for me to become a Christian? You would think I'm going to be, and he says, I hope so. I hope that's my desire. There's a point when you tell your story and you're sharing your faith that you might look at someone and say, what do you believe? Do you believe in this Jesus? <coughs> With my sister Allison, I asked that question many times before she said yes. My, and Sherry asked Allie many times, Allie, where are you at? Do you believe in Jesus yet? Well, I'm learning about him. I kind of believe in him, but I'm not ready to give my life to him. She, she, but there was a point where she said, yes, I'm ready. To ask someone, where are you at? So, Paul. Saul, who became Paul, had a story. So let me ask you, can I tell you a story? Can I give you C minus on that? Let me try again. Can I tell you a story? Nicely done, yeah. Here's a story. If, If Paul were sitting here, he'd say this. I hated Christians. I couldn't even put into words how much I thought that they were liars and deceivers and the whole Jesus thing seemed like it was made up in a joke. I hated it. So I was punishing and persecuting and destroying Christians. And when I was traveling to get more Christians, God got me. And God showed up. And I met Jesus. He spoke to me. He said, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? I said, who who are you? And man, when he told me Jesus, whoa, I'm on the wrong path. I was blinded. God gave me my sight back. And God called me to share his love with others. I've been spending the rest of my life telling the story of Jesus. And I've been changed. I was bitter and hateful. Man, I I love people. I care about people. I was self-centered. I I just, I give and I give and I give. I was religious without any real relationship. And now I know Jesus. If Paul could sit here right now, he'd tell you his story because he loved to tell his story. And he would also say this to you. You have a story. Tell it. Share it with someone. Share your story of how God's changing your life. Share your story about how you met Jesus. Your story is powerful. Second story today. Turn to John chapter 4. John chapter 4. And now we don't have a powerful man of religious influence. We have a a woman who's very powerless, who's an outcast. We don't even know her name. Uh, We're never given her name. We just know she's a woman who encountered Jesus by this well. But in John chapter 4, there's this amazing picture that unfolds uh, of, of Jesus showing up. And Jesus has gone to this place that most Jewish people would avoid. At this time, there was a centuries old, over 800, 900 years of battle between the Samaritans and the Jewish people. So the Jews would actually travel around Samaria and they'd avoid it. But he's traveling through Samaria. We find this in John 4, beginning in verse 4. He comes to this well, and, he, and Jesus is thirsty. And he's sitting, it's the middle, it's the heat of the day. He has nothing to draw with. There's all this cool water out of his reach. But this woman shows up. Verse 7. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, will you give me a drink? His disciple has gone to the town to buy food. Look at verse 9. The Samaritan woman said to him, you are a Jew, and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. That's putting it lightly. She said, how can you you ask me to help you and to serve you? But Jesus and her have this conversation. They interact. And they talk about water and living water. And she comes every day to get physical water. She comes in the middle of the day to avoid the crowds. 
only because the women who came in the morning and the evening, she didn't want to be around them, and apparently they didn't want to be around her. She was a very lonely person in the middle of the day. Look at verse 13. Jesus answered, everyone who drinks this water, he's going to take the connection from physical water to spiritual water. Jesus answered, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. He said, I want to offer you something better than water day after day after day because he knows something about her. He knows that she spends every day thirsty, thirsty for water and also thirsty for love. And she's gone through relationship after relationship after relationship and she's never found anyone who can stick with her and who really loves her and she's just empty and dry. She's she's thirsty externally, but she's thirsty in her heart and in her soul. And so then, Jesus says to her, and I I think this is very gentle. He He says, go get your husband and come back. He said, I'd like to meet your husband. Well, Jesus knows everything. He knows she doesn't have a husband. She's living with a guy. And in those days, it's, it's, it's wrong today to live together when you're not married. But in those days, it was seen, it was just, the, the way that culture viewed it was just absolutely one of the worst things possible. And she'd been through marriage, and another marriage, another marriage, another marriage, another marriage. And now she's living with a guy who didn't even bother getting married. And Jesus says, get your husband and bring him here. Well, look at her response in verse 17. I have no husband, she replied. Jesus responds to her. You are right when you say you have no husband. Now, I I think there's gentleness and compassion in the voice of Jesus, but he's telling the truth. He says, the fact is, you've had five husbands, and the man you now have is not your husband. What you have just said is quite true. Jesus uncovers the deepest point of her pain, the deepest point of her longing, because that's what Jesus does for all of us, to help us understand that what we long for is not going to be found in, in another cold glass of water or another cold beer. And it's not going to be found in another relationship or in another night sleeping with somebody. What we long for is only going to be satisfied when we really meet Jesus. So he's drawing her to himself and he's speaking the truth to her. So they begin to continue to their conversation and the woman says in verse 25, the woman said, I know the Messiah called the Christ is coming. And when he comes, he'll explain everything to us. All of our questions will be answered when the Messiah, the Savior of the world comes. And look at Jesus' response in verse 26. Then Jesus declared, I, the one speaking to you, read the next three words with me, ready? I am he. Wow. She says, we're longing, we're waiting for the Messiah. The Messiah will put everything straight in our mixed up world. And Jesus said, I'm him. That's who you're talking to. I'm the Messiah. Powerful. So what happens? Uh, the, The disciples come back and, and then she actually takes off, leaves her water jar, she heads into town. Now she avoids, she's been avoiding people, that's why she's there at high noon in the heat of the day to avoid all the people. She heads back to town, and look at verse 29. She tells the people in the town, come see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Messiah? Now she already believes it's the Messiah, but she's saying to them, maybe you'll come to believe, that could this be the Messiah? She's already had that question answered for herself. She knows he's the Messiah. But she's saying, could you come and meet him? Could this be the Messiah? I love it. This woman is transformed. And I want to look at her life, and I want you to notice something. For If you're a follower of Jesus, or if you become a Christian, and you say, well, I'm nervous about sharing my story. I don't really want to talk about my faith. Watch this woman. She, She has no formal education in this kind of stuff. She has no power, no influence. She's an outcast among her own people, and she's avoiding them, and they're avoiding her. She runs into town. And she begins talking to them about faith. And then they all start coming out to the well to meet Jesus. And and they have this revival because of this woman's encounter with Jesus and her sharing her story with them. She said, come see a man who told me everything I ever did. This Jesus knows everything about me. And you can hear it in her voice. And he loves me. He's the Messiah we've been waiting for. So what do we learn from this woman, from the Samaritan woman on telling your story? First of all, this is important. You can start telling your story about five minutes after you receive Jesus. That's the requirement. Been a Christian five minutes? Go tell your story. What? No, no, no. I, I, I'm, I'm waiting until I have it just right. It's been five months now. It's been five years now. It's been 50 years now. And I'm waiting to tell my story till I have it just right. We look at her. She didn't have any training. She didn't take an evangelism class. She didn't have like an evangel cube or a, a, an app on her phone. She just went and told people about meeting Jesus. That's what we can do. That's what we're supposed to do. Some of you are still waiting for the right moment to start telling your story. Can I tell you the right moment? It's now and now and every dot on the timeline from this point on. It's tomorrow and the next day and the next day. It's the right moment whenever there's a need. So be ready to tell your story and don't make excuses 
that you need more training because it's just telling your story and you can do that. What do we learn from this woman? That Jesus met my deepest longing and need. When she went to the people and she said, come and see a man who told me everything I ever did. You know what she's saying? He knows everything about me. This Jesus told me everything I ever did. And he didn't bail out on me like everybody else has. That's her story. I finally met someone who will hang in there with me no matter what. She told this, Jesus knows me, everything about me, and he still loves me. That's your story, that Jesus knows you through and through, all your dark places, all your sin, all your rebellion, everything you've done that's wrong. He knows all of it, and he still loves us. For God so loved the world that he sent his one and only son, John 3, 16. 1 John 4, 10, this is love, not that we love God, but that God loved us and sent his son as the atoning sacrifice for our sins. It begins with God's love. And she came to know the love of God in Jesus Christ. And then also, we learn from her that he, Jesus, is the Savior and the Lord. He is Savior. He is Lord. He's the Messiah, the one we've been waiting for. And so this woman just begins to tell her story. She wants people to know she doesn't have any training. She hasn't gotten certification. She hasn't practiced. She just runs back into town. She sets her water jar down. She runs back into town, and you can almost hear her. If she were sitting here right now, she was going to tell you her story. She'd look at us right now, and she'd say this. She'd say, you know what? I was so lonely. I was so lonely and so empty. And every day, my throat was parched and dry, so I'd go to the well to get water. But more than my throat... She'd say, my heart was dry. And I went through man after man after man after man after man. And I have another man. And my heart's still dry. But she would say to us, but I met this guy, Jesus. And all that my heart longed for, and all that I yearned for, he satisfied. This is the Messiah. This is the Savior. I'd like you to meet him. Would you come meet this Jesus? That's what we do when we tell our story. That's all we're doing is we're just telling about how we met Jesus and how he keeps showing up in our lives. He keeps doing stuff. He keeps loving and protecting and guiding and directing us. And you have a story to tell. You do. Can I tell you a story? I was 16 years old, just almost 16. Grew up in a home with no faith, no Jesus, no, no, I'd never touched a Bible. I don't think I'd ever held a Bible my whole life. And I met Jesus. My Damascus Road, my sitting at the well in Samaria was on a houseboat in Sacramento. And I met Jesus. It was real. I didn't have categories for it. I didn't know how it all worked. I just know I met Jesus. And he came into my life and he washed me clean. And the resurrected living Jesus who died on the cross for my sins washed my sins away. And became my closest friend. He became my closest friend. And to this day, he is still the closest friend I have in this world. As much as I love my wife and love my friends and love my family, Jesus is the closest one to me. And he's with me every day, every moment. And you may think I'm crazy, but I know it's true. That's my story. And you have a story. If you're a Christian, you met Jesus, tell your story. And, and, and you walk with Jesus now. He shows up. He shows up all the time in your life. And he does stuff. He, he protects you. He guides you. He gives you hope and he gives you courage. He shows up every day. Tell your stories. Because people want to know, is he real? And so, so what's, what's the right time? And what's, what's just the right moment? When do I tell my story? There's moments all day long. You're talking with somebody. And they say something like this. Man, our world's going crazy. People can't even talk to each other. Everybody's embattled and bitter. How, how could people get along? How, how can, what's going on in our world? Is there, is there anything in our world where there can be hope in this crazy world? And you say, oh, can I tell you a story? Can I tell you a story? I find my hope in Jesus. I really do. You might think I'm crazy for saying this. I find my hope in Jesus. And, and when the world's going crazy and it's going crazy, I just hold on to Jesus and I feel strong. He's like the solid rock I stand on in the middle of the storm. Somebody says to you, you know what, I've just been going through relationship after relationship and I feel so empty and I feel like every person that I get close to just burns me. Is there anyone out there that could love me the way I am and never give up on me? Is there anyone like that? You say, oh, can I tell you a story? 
Can I tell you a story about how Jesus is that one for me who is always there no matter what? Can I tell you a story about this Jesus? Somebody says, you know, I, have, I just try to keep changing my life for the better and it keeps getting worse and worse. I have no power. I have no strength to change my life. I feel powerless. Is there any power out there? And you say to him, what? Can I tell you a story <laughs> about the one who has all the power in the universe and who loves you and wants to fill you and forgive you and strengthen you? Can I tell you a story? Someone says, tell me about yourself. I'm gonna get to know you better. Oh, there's an open door. <laughs> Can I tell you a story? about what matters most in my life? Yeah, what matters most in your life? And they want you to say your kids or your spouse or your job or your money or your car. And you say, you know what matters most in my life is the one I met two years ago, 20 years ago, 40 years ago. His name's Jesus. Because of him, I can love my spouse. I can love my kids. I can have meaning in life. But, but he's the one, man. He's the one that guides my life. You have a story. You do, if you're a Christian. And you can tell that story. In the next 24 hours, 48 hours, someone's going to ask you a question, say something, and, and you're going to feel like the Holy Spirit says to you, ask them this question. Can I tell you a story? And everybody likes a story. Can I tell you a story? Sure. And tell your story. And let God take care of the rest. Whether it's Saul or the woman at the well or me or you, if you've met Jesus, you have a story. And that story is powerful. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, I pray that you would teach us to tell your story within our story. That we would share about how you've changed our life, how you've come in, how you love us and protect us and guide us in this crazy world. And Lord, there's people that are waiting to hear good news and we have it. So I pray that every person here who knows you, Jesus, every person in the family worship venue, every person online in our military community that's listening online right now, that we would just really understand if we met you and we love you, that we have a story to tell. And give us just calm, bold courage to share the story, the many stories of how you're at work and living in our lives and transforming us. And as we tell the story, Lord Jesus, will you touch people's hearts with your truth and draw them to yourself. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.